if the uh, next panel is ready, which I think they pretty much are, um, then I would like to introduce uh, Susanna, who will be chairing this panel and who can uh, present all of our different panelists. Thank you. So this is a great panel with an excellent group of speakers, and the title of the panel is about impact evaluation in one form or another. But we're also, the paper, in the paper we talked also about learning, because this is not just about understanding how this works, how technology works, or understanding how you can use technology to actually evaluate, but also how organizations can learn and improve what they're doing. So we are going to start in the order in the program with Peter Vandevant from Columbia University. And Peter's going to have to run right after he talks. Hi. Uh, th thanks for having me. Um, I would like to talk about crowd seeding. So let me start off with a completely obvious thing. For a good assessment, because that's what the panel is about, for a good assessment, you need good data. Well, that's very easily said. It's very much less easy, uh, easily done. Um, so together with McCartan, I've been working in the Congo for the last six years, um, together with NGOs, together with the peacekeepers, the Muslim army, and I think one of the major things is, ah, there we go, in general we really don't know what's going on over there. So a lot of events are taking place and we really don't know what's going on and that they're taking place. So the question we set out uh, ourselves uh, in 2009 was the following, how to obtain high quality data and sensitive data on conflict in real time from the DR Congo. So High quality, I mean mainly representative. So at the moment it's very difficult because well the conflicts are taking place and we don't know, well we don't learn about it because they take place in very isolated areas. Uh, plus if we can finally get there, we can't get there of course during a conflict, but then when we finally get there, people are displaced, they maybe died. Um, then the next point is very sensitive information. We're very often interested in things like conflict, uh, but these are things like uh, very, there's a lot of mistrust often in these kind of areas. You already see yourself going into these villages and asking, so, have you been raped? So, your house burned down, who did it? Try to get good data on that. And finally, we want data that's in real time. If something happens, we don't want to know about it two months later, we want to know about it right away. So the first thing we thought about when we were thinking about this question was, well, let's use crowdsourcing. Let's have a cell phone. And let's just tell people that if something happens, you send a text message to this wonderful cell phone and we'll learn about all these events. Um, it sounds great, uh, but in the Congo, that's very unlikely to work for several reasons. So the field realities in the Congo, bottom line is, places are very isolated, what I already just said. Um, actually, the one on the left, that's more an exception. Normally with cars, you can't get to most of the villages. Um, so let me actually put it as follows, a little bit more structured. Let's say the population consists out of four different groups. We have uh, one column with knowledge, so people that would know about that cell phone, if you would have a crowdsourcing project, and the means, so people that, if they know about it, they can also send a text message, so they would actually, they would have a cell phone, or, and they would have the means in order to send the text message. Well, in the Congo, a lot of places are isolated, so there's no knowledge of the project. Very nice that we've got the cell phone where people can send messages to, but nobody will ever know about it. So that gets a very large chunk away of the population. Then the means, needless to say, it's a very poor area. So there's no means to participate in a project for most of the people. Even if they have a cell phone, they're not willing to send you the text message. So this is what we're left with. Very likely, this is a very, very small part of the crowd. And more important, this is not a representative part of the crowd. So good buy high quality data. Okay, so we introduced a concept which is called crowd seeding. And crowd seeding is nothing more than just combining this idea of ICT with standard survey techniques. So what we did is we distributed cell phones and phone credit. So we actually gave the means to the people and we did this to a randomly selected sample of the population. Now the wonderful thing of this is, is that you've got your crowd back again. You give the means to people and you give the knowledge of the project to the people. In fact, there are three things that I think that are very important with crowd seeding is that and you reach a larger part of the crowd, it's representative and very important in these kind of areas, you build a relationship. You know the person that has a cell phone and that person knows you and over time you build a relationship, which means you build trust. And as what I will say in, the, in a second, 
this means that people start trusting you and start providing you much more and much high quality data, especially on sensitive issues. Okay? Now, this is all very nice in theory, uh, but can we actually introduce something like this? How does this work in practice? Uh, so this is the area of operation. Uh, I've been working here for the last six years. Uh, those two dots is, uh, is Goma at the top and Bukava at the bottom. We work more or less in that area. And what we did is we piloted a project just in 18 villages, just to see if it works, um, between 2009 and 2011. So let me very briefly touch upon the basics of this project. Each village has th had three representatives, the chief, the head of the women's association, and a democratically elected person. We distributed a code book, so those villages were randomly selected. Then we distributed a code book to uh, those three people, uh, including cell phone, and we gave them very extensive training, how to use the cell phone, about what kind of events and all that. Then we had a technical representative and a field representative in Bukavu, and all this worked with a very cheap small netbook, a bunch of very cheap cell phones, and, and all free software programs. Um, and then we put an incentive structure in place that made sure that people sent text messages. So whenever somebody sent a text message, they would be immediately reimbursed for the text message. Plus, whenever um, there was an additional incentive, every week they would receive about one and a half dollars in phone credit. Uh, and they would receive this if they had sent at least one text message per week, which could have been an empty message. Nothing happened this week. Um, and um, so basically we asked them to send messages about every possible event that can take place in the village. And that's exactly what people did. So over a very short period of time with just a few people, we received thousands upon thousands of messages. The nice thing was is that we were in the first instance very much afraid that people would only send small codes, is how we started up, given that there was a very low lit literacy rate. We started up with just codes, but people started sending complete text messages. We found that there was no reporting fatigue whatsoever among the villagers, um, and people actually sent very detailed information, very often like, these houses were burned down by the cap this particular captain with name and all that kind of information. Um, so to keep things very, very short, uh, as a conclusion, well, it, it seems to work. What do I mean with that? Um, we, there was a large uptake among the people. People were very enthusiastic about this program, grassroots, very much so. Um, Plus, we had a field representative that would actually check upon the information, and we found that the data that was sent was of very, very high quality information. Um, it's very cheap, so this was funded with U by USAID, but at the end of the grant period, we actually sent the largest chunk of the money back to them because we hadn't spent the money yet. Um, now, as, uh, as I already just said now, I, I have to leave in a little bit, and I won't be there tomorrow, uh, but let me put out two things out there for, for the discussion maybe of tomorrow. So all of this is very nice, and it's great that we get this lovely information, which I really think is much better than just crowdsourcing information. But two points here. The first point is, well, great that you've got this fantastic information, but what happened in 2009, I was walking around with this cell phone in my pocket, and this started out as a completely academic exercise. And I would get a text message literally saying the following, at the moment, the house of my neighbor is being uh, pillaged. Oh, whoa, shit, I can't just keep this in a data set for me to run a regression in two years once in order to get it into a nice academic journal. So this also gives you this obligation that something has to be done with this data. So we set up this whole system where we work together with NGOs and the and Monusco Army. Uh, but it's definitely one of the things to keep in mind is that you raise expectations by, by putting a system like this in place. Okay, you raise expectations among the people themselves. The second and very last point um, is that the nice thing of crowd seeding is that the people are identifiable which has all these fantastic properties that I was just saying that, well, now you can interact with the people, you build trust, you can actually get in contact with them. That's exactly what we did. We phoned them very often. Now, the problem with that is, is that, well, they're identifiable. So it means I can find them. It also means that rebel groups can find them. Um, so it also brings along this very ethical baggage of um, kind of this ethical part of, of sensitivity. What do you do with the data? How far to share this? Um, so this is definitely one of the things that has to be keep, kept in mind as well. Thanks, I'll uh, leave it at there. Great. Thank you for the excellent and short presentation. Have a great trip. Um, okay, <laughs> Sabina Carlson from the Future Generations Project in Haiti, but also one of the major engines behind the Ushahidi Haiti Project. Yes. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, I don't know where the clicker is. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm one of, uh, I'm really excited to be here. I'm probably one of the youngest and definitely one of the shortest people uh, who's been up on the stage, so I'm going to stand. Um, 
I, I really just wanted to start uh, referencing the wonderful white paper that was written for uh, this panel. If you haven't gotten a chance to read it, I, I would advise that you do it before we have the discussion tomorrow. Uh, the fundamental concept here uh, is that peace builders need to be acutely aware of the evolving changes that are happening in the communities that they work with in order to be effective. One of the ways to do that is with ICT technology and crowdsourcing, uh, as we're gonna get into. But for that to work, there's two missing links that the paper highlights. Um, one is communities being motivated to contribute data and information, and the other is that res for responders to be motivated to actually respond to it. Um, so I'm gonna just go into some evidence of these missing links, um, and I'm first gonna start out with a humanitarian context from post-earthquake Haiti. As most of you hopefully remember, there was a uh, massive earthquake that hit the island of Haiti in uh, 2010. It caused one of the greatest humanitarian crises uh, in recent history. Um, and it caused a great need for data. And both traditional uh, data, data gathering techniques and crowdsourcing were in play here, each one of them with their respective weaknesses and strengths. Um, I'd gone to Port-au-Prince in uh, March of 2010 uh, and because I speak fluent Creole, I was asked to volunteer to monitor some of the post-disaster needs assessments, the PDNAs that were being done. So while the PDNAs were incredibly important, they laid the data uh, foundation for the rest of the response, because MIT played an important role in one of them. Um, there was, I also watched immense frustration and stress on the behalf of the uh, disaster-affected population who had to respond to these. Um, in one camp, uh, an interviewee, basically screamed and shouted at her interviewer saying, after being asked to rank her needs, uh, isn't it good enough for you that I don't have a place for my kids to sleep tonight? So this creates a sense of kind of disempowerment and frustration. Um, and another thing with traditional data assessment is you only get what you ask for. One of the really important pieces of information that was lost on data collection at the time for earthquake affected communities such as City Soleil, the greatest danger was the fact that the national prison had broken down and the gangsters had gotten out and went back to terrorize the communities that they were from. This was left out of many of those early data assessments. Um, so this is where crowdsourcing is a great complement to this traditional data assessment processes. Hmm, okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let there be light. Um, and so there's, um, and, and for again, but for those to, they let people have a voice, speak their own, pe uh, their own realities and also allows us to get information that we may not have otherwise even thought to ask for. Um, but again, for this to work, we have to make sure that communities are contributing information to these systems. Uh, I was fortunate to be part of the Ushahidi Haiti response, where I had a lecture with Tufts, there's some faces here, people who are part of that. Um, and in the beginning, there was such a volume of response. People wanted to contribute data, they heard about it, and in some ways, we were victims of our own success in that there was such volume of information. It was impossible to guarantee even just a response in terms of information. Yes, we've acknowledged that we've received your text, let alone a response on the ground. The reason I was in Port-au-Prince in May was to investigate that. Why had the data spigot about a month after, about a month after the earthquake had pretty much turned off. People were mostly asking about the weather. Um, so I went down to ask why, and it wasn't just with Ushahidi, but by March of 2010, people were tired of responding to things. They were just, they were, they'd given information to SMS, to interviewees, to all sorts of people coming through and asking them questions. And not just the response, but without people thinking that their information goes somewhere, they just got tired. If you were texting a friend for a month and they never responded back, you would stop. Um, most of you do not know this map. Uh, it's the NULA HT. Uh, it is basically an amazing Haitian, uh, uh, crowdsourcing platform that was developed by the, ta uh, the company Solutions. Um, and Ushahidi, we decided to partner with them because and support this amazing homegrown crowdsourcing platform. And by helping them with some technical uh, advice and some connections with the humanitarian organizations. That was my job. I was down there and I was trying to convince the clusters and the humanitarians to adopt this platform and use it in some way. And time after time after time, it was turned down said, I don't want a part to be part of this. And the one, three main reasons, one, it was too complicated to integrate this data into their existing platforms. Uh, the second was really that they didn't trust the source of the data, which is a common issue that we have with crowdsourcing. But the overriding response gets at what actually a colleague just spoke about. People didn't want the moral responsibility of accepting data that they might not be able to respond to. They just would not take it. Traditional data assessment, you assess what you, what's relevant to you. 
You know, if you're a WASH NGO, you're going to assess WASH because you know you can respond to it. But when you turn the spigot of crowdsource data on, you can't turn it off and you can't say, I want that and I don't want that. People were afraid of that. Um, so how to mend some of these missing links if we really want to get crowdsource data as part of our way to evaluate our effectiveness. Um, I'm gonna, just going to take, um, what's really important, interesting here is that do we have any good models of this working? And I'd love to hear more tomorrow at the discussion if people have other models of how this works. But I found the more I looked up to clusters and NGOs and UN agencies, I just didn't see anything working. But I think that if we actually look down at individual communities, we can see examples of how this works. An example I'm going to give you very quickly is City Soleil, um, where I've had the privilege of working with communities there for the past four years and living there for the uh, two of those years. Um, just briefly, City Soleil is uh, one of the largest slums in Haiti, I don't like that word, um, and it has been plagued by gang violence for more than a decade. Um, and what's really interesting, people in City Soleil are already using technology to monitor, pe monitor peace, um, uh, peace indicators on the ground. Um, people um, in Haiti with Digicel, five SMSs gets you 50 free SMSs. So there's unlimited capacity for texting. And people are using Facebook and Twitter and their texts to report on everything, who's fighting with who, where's safe, who's doing what, where are there opportunities for peace. My husband was, was raised in City Soleil. We were in West Virginia, and we were getting real-time updates of inter-neighborhood conflicts, who had just been killed and whose body was burned on exactly what street corner. So this is happening. One of the reasons people contribute information at missing link number one is they get feedback, they get response. People text back, their neighbors, their local leaders. You get that response that people want to contribute into that in the system. Um, and that second uh, problem, which is do people want to respond to this? When you're, we have, as people or outsiders, we get to choose what we respond to. We get to say, no, that's not in our mandate. That's not relevant. We don't have the funding for that. Local organizations and local actors, they don't have that luxury. That's not an option. They get information, they have to respond. It's a feedback loop and information is, is survival. Um, they don't get, and there's an accountability there that they need to maintain that feedback loop because they don't get to walk away like we do. So it's just been, we have time to get into it. Time is almost up. We can talk about it tomorrow. I know this is not a simple thing, but I really think that we can learn from communities themselves, community, specific communities affected by violence because they've had to get good at this. How to use technology to monitor violence and peace on the ground. And I want to end with this last quote, I mean, <laughs> this last thought, which is that no one can want peace more than the communities who are affected by violence. We cannot want peace more than they do. So we have to build on what they've already started, what communities have developed, and see if we can't learn from them while we're trying to build these bigger systems and uh, tackle these bigger issues. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina, that was excellent. Um, so Professor Larry Suskin with MIT and Harvard will talk about conflict mediation processes and situate this within. Uh, I work as a mediator. Um, from the vantage point of a mediator, there's all kinds of help you can provide for us. I work through the Consensus Building Institute, cbuilding.org. We provide mediation in all kinds of contexts with a network of several dozen mediators who work all around the world. Sometimes shooting is broken out. Sometimes tensions are building and people would like not to have the shooting break out. Sometimes tensions are simmering and people see the problem and they would like assistance. Sometimes groups have just been locked into a very long-term unproductive set of interactions and they would like assistance to see if they can turn that around. In all of those contexts, mediators intervene at the request, typically, of a convener, not just one of the parties, but often some entity that's concerned about the conflict could be one of the parties. And ultimately, all the parties have to accept this friendly outsider who's coming to assist. And I'm presenting things from this standpoint of the N plus one party where N are all stakeholders and the plus one party is to help them deal with the conflict. Because I think you need to take a vantage point when you think about whether take conflict, 
add ICT, do you get a better result? You have to take an angle, a vantage point to think about that. So I'm taking a mediation perspective, and I'm going to quickly run through the five or six kinds of helps, help that we as mediators need from you and talk about how the parties would assess and the mediator would assess whether that help added something sufficient to get a better result. The first step the mediator has to face is, how do I get all the right parties to the table? And how do I get them to agree what the agenda is going to be that we work on? And how do we get an agreement on a timetable? And how can we figure out who can represent which stakeholder groups? So everything you've heard about stakeholder assessment, conflict assessment, we need help. We show up. Someone's called us, but not everyone. How do we assess the conflict? How do we figure out who the stakeholders are? How do we get them to say what their concerns are? How do we map the conflict? How do we figure out what information they're going to need? How do we figure out who can represent which group? We then assume we've done that. Now the parties are at the table. We have a whole set of tasks before us. Many of them now involve dialogue amongst the parties. How can we assist the parties in understanding each other's concerns? The people at the table speak for other people. You can immediately imagine that someone at the table wonders whether someone else at the table is adequately representing the diversity of views within their side. You can begin to imagine what kind of help the mediator and the parties need to be able to understand whether someone speaking for or speaking like a category of people really, in fact, is doing that. Can you imagine what kind of help you can provide? We need to learn to appreciate the views of all the groups at the table. We need to help people at the table, away from the table, prepare to present their own views effectively. What kind of tutorial help can we provide in the midst of a mediation to assist parties in clarifying what they want to present to the others in the face-to-face -face dialogue? They're talking. Are they understanding each other? What kind of assistance can you imagine providing to keep the pulse of the dialogue to help parties understand whether they are understanding each other? whether they fully appreciate the interests on all sides. And ultimately, what we need is a map of the conflicts that the parties have now created. Can you imagine helping to visualize that in the course of a multi-party conversation that may extend over a period of time? Then, after we've done that, we now move into a problem-solving mode. The parties might want to know, well, what have been some other efforts to respond to conflicts like this, and how did they handle it? Could you imagine having an online inventory of agreements parsed in ways that people could begin to work with them? You might want to look at something we've created called the Aquapedia, which is a list of water conflicts described in a way that then invites all the parties to amend and alter what other people have said about that conflict. So you can look at 40, 50, 60 major water conflicts in the world, and you can see in a Wikipedia-type type fashion how people are adding their commentary on it so that we end up with a product that still other people in other conflicts can search and see what sorts of actions were taken in response to those difficulties. So we bring the parties together in problem solving, the goal of which is to produce an agreement. We have to produce a draft of that agreement. That draft has to be open for comments in its penultimate form by all the parties represented by all the people at the table. You can immediately imagine what system of incorporating that kind of commentary might be invented to help the parties produce an agreement in a living form that everyone has been part of. Then they want to know, how are we going to implement this? Well, can you inventory for me all the laws that are relevant? What do we have to take into account? in making this agreement work? Who do we have to interact with? Can you map the context within which the agreement's going to need, move, need to move forward? And can you help the parties see that? And ultimately, when there is an agreement, then we need to set up a system to help monitor its implementation. So all parties can watch whether everyone else who said they were going to do certain things really doing that. Now, 
Not all agreements take this contractual type of form. Sometimes we have a meeting just to get people to understand each other, and you hope there's been some improvement. But in any kind of dispute resolution, conflict management, conflict interaction, part, get the parties in a conflict to interact, in any kind of context like that, the measure of success is whether the parties have, in fact, been better able to deal with their differences. And then are the organizations or the networks that they're part of able to learn something from every move that they make that allows them to continue to get better at dealing with their differences going forward. ICT to succeed in assisting in conflict situations needs to build the capacities of the parties and the institutions they represent. From my standpoint, those are the criteria. Then you can begin to talk about all the different kinds of tools you've heard throughout the time that you're here and begin to think about, can we build ICT that will add value in the eyes of the parties from the standpoint of the M plus one player trying to assist them? Thank you. Thank you very much for reminding us of the complexity of this task and the complex relational arrangements that go through every stage. Emile Bruno from MIT will give us an individual focus perspective. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm a researcher now at the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department here at MIT. Uh, but before this, uh, this current incarnation as an academic, I was actually a teacher. I was a high school and elementary teacher. And during the summers, I would travel, as teachers are wont to do. And one of these summers, I found myself at a conflict resolution program in Ireland as a volunteer. So this is uh, one of these intuitive programs that's based on the common sense assumption that if you bring Catholic and Protestant kids together for a positive experience, that you can change their attitudes towards each other. Well, the, the program went off without a hitch until uh, the very last day when the kids were ready to go home. A, a fight broke out between two of the boys, and it immediately split the group down partisan lines, and there was a full-scale 100-child brawl. So I left this experience, of course, wondering what the hell we had just done. Uh, wondering uh, if other programs do better, um, wondering if some of the interventions that compose the program brought the groups further apart, whereas some of them brought them closer together. So this uh, informs my current research program, which is trying to ask these questions systematically. So trying to better understand the psychological and cognitive biases that help drive conflict so that we can get some kind of handle on what types of programs work, what programs don't, and for whom. So, I wanted to give you a few different lessons that I think uh, cognitive science, science in general, but cognitive science also in particular, gives us uh, that might be helpful for thinking about conflict resolution. So the first is very simply that uh, we should test our intuitions empirically, that there's reason to believe that our intuitions can fail. So we, we have examples of this, for example, from medical interventions, right? The evidence-based approach in medicine has revealed that a lot of the common sense uh, interventions that we have are unproductive and sometimes even counterproductive, that they're killing uh, more people than they're helping. And I think that this can be true also for social interventions like the one I engaged in, these conflict resolution programs. And there's actually reason to believe that these programs that try to intervene, uh, these social interventions might be even more, uh, more susceptible to these types of things. So my favorite example of this is a social intervention. Uh, this is just a story of something that happened at the Petrified Forest National Park. Here at this park, there was this basic social intervention. It was a sign to try to get people to stop stealing petrified wood from the park. So it reads, your heritage is being vandalized every day by theft losses of petrified wood of 14 tons a year, mostly small piece at a time. So this is built on the intuition that this will shock people into stopping this terrible behavior. But when a social scientist went to the park, they were terrified because we as social scientists know that our behaviors are really strongly influenced by descriptive norms. So by saying that everybody does it, that might actually encourage people to do it. But they didn't stop there. They wanted to actually run a quick study. So what they did was they alternated different signs, and they marked individual little pieces of petrified wood, and then they just quantified how many pieces were stolen given each of these interventions. So here's the first intervention. This doesn't include a norm. It just says, don't remove petrified wood. Don't steal stuff. 
Um, we can compare that to no sign at all, which is the baseline. And we can compare it to a sign that includes this social norm. So it says, many past visitors have removed petrified wood. Don't do it. Okay, so here are the results from that little study. Here's the baseline with no sign. About 3% of the wood was stolen. If we include the sign that just says, don't steal petrified wood, it has some effect. If we include a sign that says, everybody <laughs> does it, don't do it, that actually encourages the very behavior that we're trying to prevent. And there's actually a reason why this might be happening, and we can find it in the brain. So um, one of the favorite analogies for how the brain works is that it's like a rider on an elephant. The rider is the part of your brain that you have conscious, introspective access to. You can ask it, why did you do that? And then your brain can tell you back, I did it because I didn't like that, or I didn't want to do that. But the vast majority of your brain is actually like the elephant. That is, we have no introspective access to it, and yet it still guides our behavior. So norms have a strong effect on the elephant. We discount the effect that they're going to have on us. We don't think that norms are going to affect us that much, but that's because it's not affecting the rider. It's not affecting the conscious part of our brain. It's affecting the unconscious part of our brain. So that's lesson number one. We have to evaluate our intuitions because our intuitions are based on what we think is going to affect the rider and not the elephant. So lesson number two is when you're actually um, doing this, when you're testing your intuitions empirically by evaluating programs, use a control group. And I have a, kind of an anecdote and experience to illustrate this. Um, so I've been involved in trying to help a number of programs evaluate their effectiveness. One is Solia. So this is one of these, uh, they call themselves virtual contact programs. And the idea is they bring together students in the US with students from the Arab and Muslim world together uh, online for repeated interactions over the course of a semester or an entire year. So what I've done is I've set up these evaluations, pre and post surveys, to try to assess these psychological factors. Um, this one is just change in warmth. How warm do you feel towards the other group with an intuitive measure? It's just a thermometer. Um, and what we can see here is if we just look at the Solia participants, this is the change in warmth from pre to post survey, we see no change whatsoever. Right? But without a control group, we have no idea what this means. Consider this. This program actually spanned the Boston Marathon bombings. So this makes the interpretation of this result impossible. It could be that this is a really positive result, that it insulate, the program insulates the students from making negative inferences about the other group as a whole, or it could mean that the program has no effect whatsoever. Right? You'd need to know what would happen to the students if they weren't in the program. And the best way to do that is to use a control group of students who are matched to the students who you're testing. So we did for this evaluation. These are American students who are in the program. We had a group of American students who were in the same courses taught by the same professors, but they just weren't in the Cilia program. And you see their responses decreased dramatically over this time. So now you can actually interpret this result, whereas before you couldn't. You could look at the longer term effects, too. Once, we, once the Boston Marathon bombings happened, we included a, another measure. So just your belief, how much does Islam teach peace versus violence? So we can test this right after the program. We can see how sustained these beliefs are. In the Solia participants, we had this value. So uh, they were 80 on a scale of 1 to 100. That's great, but what does that mean? Right? Is that affected by the program? It looks to be stable, but does this mean that they have a, a really stable view of Islam that isn't going to be affected by the program, or that the program affected it and it, the change remained? Well, if we look at co the control group, we can see that there's the positive outcome, right? whereas without the control group, we can't make any inference. So a final lesson is that we should work towards measuring unconscious biases, that we should look to measuring what's going on with the elephant and not just the rider. So here's an example of a cognitive process that we can introspect about. If I ask you to multiply 17 by 18 in your head, and then I ask you, how did you do that? You can tell me, right? I multiplied 7 and 8. I carried the 5. You know, you can go through the whole process. That's done by the rider. But if I tell you, why did you reject that peace proposal? There are a lot of processes that you could tell me, some reasons why, but a lot of the reasons we know why people reject peace proposals are things that are going on in the elephant. So there are a number of ways that we can do this. We can uh, develop behavioral measures that are based on performance. Uh, what I'm trying to do is uh, develop measures that are based on neuroimaging, where you can actually look at what's going on in the entire brain and not just rely on self-report. So that's it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. 
quicker. So Patrick Meng from the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative with his co-author, who I will let you introduce. She's uh, here somewhere. Yes. Uh, she might be uh, taking Fung care Fung? of it. Fong, yes. Yeah, okay. uh, she's also my wife. Um, and uh, she's responsible for more than half of the work that's here. Um, I am shamelessly plugging some of the programs we're working on, um, but they also explain a little bit the perspective that we come from. Uh, one of them is called Peace Building Data uh, dot org and, and the idea and the origin of this program we've worked on for now over 10 years is to actually try to understand what people experience during conflict, um, how it affects them in their daily lives from health and mental health to perception of institutions, perception uh, of security actors, perception of their environment, perception of each other, all the way to understanding what they would like to see happen in the future, asking questions like, well, what do you think should be built, should be done to build peace, or what do you think should be done to improve security? So in the process of doing this work, we really need, realized that we needed to be much faster at producing the results, and that led us to really work on technology. And as always with my wife, I was saying, that's never gonna work, and she said, yes, it's gonna work. It worked. Um, and so we really started investing in those digital data collection platform uh, also nearly 10 years ago uh, to improve first the speed of data collection. But in the process, we really disrupted what we collect and how we collect uh, in terms of quality, in terms of quantity, in terms of the type of information that we're able to collect, in, type of, in terms of the type of uh, intervention that we're able to, uh, to look at from, from demobilization to overall uh, population survey. And the last project is something that we're really just starting with uh, MIT Media Lab with the Overseas Development Institute, which is to look at big data and our popular uh, ID, but really look at it from a, a responsible way. How can we use in a responsible uh, way big data to look at big so social problems, including peace building? So these are my bias. The last bias that is not as much on the slide is that uh, I spend, after spending many years in the field, uh, I became an academic, which means that now and in this talk, I will raise a lot of questions and offer uh, very little uh, answers <laughs> to them. Um, so in, in, in practice, I will talk about two points. One is uh, the need to, uh, to look at evidence uh, evaluation that is centered on peace. So I'll, let's call it peace-centered evaluation. And the second thing I will talk about is not uh, evaluation of peace building, but evaluation of technology using peace building. So back to the first point and what do I mean by uh, peace building centered evaluation or peace centered evaluation is the idea that we need to move away from project specific evaluation. Now it's great, it's really important, don't get me wrong, it's really important to evaluate projects, to evaluate interventions, to know what works and what doesn't work. But what we're really missing is how a society is doing as a whole in terms of progressing towards peace. How are we doing? Great, my project on empowering women and giving, t telling them about their rights worked. We don't have peace today. So we need to look more broadly at, uh, at uh, what's happening in terms of, uh, of peace building. In contradiction with that, we also need to look at things locally. How come after 20 years of conflict in Eastern Congo, I still cannot tell what's going on in that community versus that community? How come I don't have the degree of granularity, the degree of details that I can understand from a very local level what's uh, happening? Technology can help. And in many ways what we are doing with, with the technology and the peace building data is, is incremental, right? We're traditionally using survey methods. We talked a little bit earlier about quality data, about representative data. That's what we do. And we have methods to work in conflict area methods that keep the cost low, but are done so that you can make it in a way that re yields reliable, scientifically valid information about what's going on in a country. And we do it using technology that facilitates the speed of production of data. It's not the only way of doing that. We heard about crowdseeding. You've heard about crowdsourcing today. The truth is there are also many, many low-hanging fruits in technology. So it's great to talk about these advanced platforms. We could even fly drones and take pictures and monitor peace or events or things like that. But what about connecting people? What about making sure that every official's offices has access to internet? How come the Red Cross offices in most countries, in many countries, half of them, I think, don't have internet connectivity? Low-hanging fruits means that digitizing things, Half the administration that I know, may, well, maybe 90% in Eastern Congo, work with paper, nothing else. So there are many low-hanging fruits that will help us 
collect and, uh, and, and, uh, and deal with information in, in a way that, uh, that helps with them. Now, that brings the second part of my point, which is we need to evaluate technology. We need to understand the context, and obviously not, uh, um, the same technology is not going to work uh, in, in every context. And we heard earlier questions around literacy and, and, uh, and people's ability to, ev to use various forms of technology. And we all laughed, and yet it's done all the time. And we need to evaluate technology and think about it in a different way than we evaluate peace building, right? We cannot use the same indicators. What we are looking is not whether the project using technology helped build peace, what we are looking is, did the technology component of it work? How do we do that? What are some of the indicators? What are some of the characteristics that are associated when a technology works or doesn't work? They are intrinsic characteristics. Is it a technology that is usably easy to uh, demonstrate? Does it provide clear benefits? Is it uh, demonstrable? Can I, can I just uh, test it? Is it easy to learn? So there are a number of characteristics that, that will help do, us do that. And part of this is also questioning, look, around us, all the platforms that we heard today, they are great. In one year time, half of them will no longer exist. Half the crisis map that we, we look at will not be maintained. And when that process happens, well, okay, maybe some succeeded, some didn't succeed, but the point is we are losing a vast amount of knowledge, what people have learned in the process of building those technologies. And we are losing it because people move on because they are doing other things. So we're losing not only the information that, and, and the effect that they had in country, but really the know-how that was acquired in that way. So we need to be much better at systematically evaluating the technology itself, finding the right indicators, the right way to, uh, to collect that information and share it. So these were the two main points I wanted to do, and hopefully we'll have a lot of time to discuss uh, uh, today and tomorrow. Thank you. Great. three minutes okay great so thank you excellent short tight to the point and full of problems that we don't have answers to so on that note I would love to we're gonna discuss these things tomorrow but I'd love to give the audience three to four minutes to pose any questions that are on your mind now and that will take to our group tomorrow to discuss including the panelists if you have anything that you'd like to put on the table Uh, great presentations all around. Uh, this question is for the cognitive science guy. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Emil. <laughs> Emil. So I saw that some of the questions were like, um, okay, now I'm nervous, I'm forgetting. Uh, it was, I think, who, Okay, I forgot the question. There but was a, you mean the evaluation? Yeah, what was Islam teaches peace? Yes, yes, yeah. that one, yeah. So <laughs> you get a really emotional response, subconscious response to a question like that. And so you're getting the logical answer that people give, but maybe there's kind of social processes that kind of impact what type of answers they give. So you might be getting the conscious answer, people think they're supposed to say yes, but then this other part of their brain actually believes in a different answer. So how do you measure that part? Like maybe what their heart says. Yeah, exactly. Well, well that's, that's why I'm really interested in, in pursuing these other measures, these alternate measures. So ideally, I'd like to have, for example, a neuroimaging measure of open-mindedness. Right? Open-mindedness towards the other side's views is very difficult to get at right now. If you ask people if they're open-minded, they'll say, yeah, sure, I'm open-minded but they don't really know, I think, how they're processing the information from the other side. So um, if I can get a neuroimaging measure that works, then I could take a subset of the people who are involved in this program, I could do a neuroimaging scan pre and post, and I could get uh, what I think might be a, a complementary measure uh, to the traditional kind of self-report measures. But there are also uh, performance-based measures, uh, uh, reaction time tasks that can get at um, the types of associations you build towards the other group. And I think these are really interesting too, and they have a lot of uh, room for development. Great, that was a direct question. The other ones we're gonna try to take tomorrow, but if there's anything yeah. that absolutely, a two finger, that's okay. Any others? I will ask the mediator here, uh, or others to comment about 
conflicts or resolutions that have significant time frames for resolving, given that the mean population age is like 15 to 17, and some of these problems are going to take more than that time period to de you know, devolve the power to away from some corrupt central government into them. What, what, what's your thoughts about the time frame versus For those of you not familiar with Herb Kelman's work at Harvard, you might want to <coughs> look at it relative to this question. Kelman took very long-standing disputes like Cyprus, and he got younger people who others thought would end up in leadership roles in a decade. And he brought those people together face to face in, in an informal setting every year for several years for a period of weeks to try to build relationships amongst those people. And they guessed right on some of those people and they moved into leadership positions and when they were in that capacity, they had a different set of ties to people on the other side, not only a different set of perspectives. So one notion is that some intractable concept, conflicts are so deep-rooted that what we need to do is think intergenerationally, but what it, you need to do is not just have different stuff in what they're learning in school, but to in fact begin to work to build relationships over time. So much peace building is about relationships. There was mention of trust earlier. There's a lot of things that have been said about information. It all has to change relationships. Maybe you'll see it, the brain scan change uh, at some point over a period of decades as relationships evolve. But the work we need to do is about, in some of the intractable disputes, building relationships amongst people, which is a long time task. Okay, great. We have one more question, and then we'll 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 take this tomorrow in the in the panel discussion. So, last question. Hi, my question can totally be answered tomorrow, um, but I was hoping there could be some time allotted to talking about how technology, as the channel for collection of data, um, can cha can be a factor in changing how that data um, is com comes in. So, whether people are more or less likely to share honestly, um, and what different factors within a context affect that, because I imagine it has different effect in different places. So thank you. Great question. Anyone who has a few, another question sitting in your head, please write it down, and let's discuss it in detail in the, in the breakout session tomorrow. OK, thank you for an excellent panel. Thank you to you all. And now.